Uh, we're live now. We are live right now. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Hope you're all doing well. We are very happy to be here and to be here with everyone. And we are going to start. I'm going to start with introducing myself. I'm Sara Badran and I'm from the ArcNode team. And with us, we have Jinan and we have Rupaya, and we have Mr. Chad Oppenheim. <laughs> uh, first of all, I want to make a brief introduction about us, the ARCNO team. We were established in 2016 in the University of Petra, and we are a part of the Student Council. We have organized over 120 events of design and architecture and over the past few years and we started the series mainly because uh, we're going through a tough time and we think that it's a really good time to get inspired and aspired and to learn new things. Our guest today is Chad Oppenheim. He is a Miami-based international architect whose work encompasses all realms of design uh, ranging from large-scale open urban architecture and hotels, resorts, luxury homes to interiors and furnishing. He founded Oppenheim Architecture in 1999 and since then the company gained global recognition for being socially and environmentally conscious in its architecture as well as setting trends in the sustainable and humanitarian sectors. Um, Mr. Chad, I'll give you the floor now. Um, and uh, let's start. Well, thank you so much. It's uh, I'm really honored to be able to speak with you, uh, maybe sometime soon in, in person, uh, because I was saying I was supposed to be in Jordan a couple of weeks ago before this all happened. So uh, I love Jordan. It's one of my favorite places uh, in the world, and I really enjoy uh, the people and the culture, and it's uh, very inspiring for me. So I'm going to I put together a, a presentation uh, showing uh, our work in the spectrum of uh, the Middle East and, and, and the work that we do there. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Let's see. Share. Just a... Is that working? Is that, uh, do you see uh, the yeah. screen? Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, as a kid, I really enjoyed uh, playing in the sand and I really enjoy playing in the sand uh, today. So um, I'm going to show you uh, some of the work that, that we've been doing and uh, and speak about our, our philosophies. But first, I wanted to give you a, a little bit of background about myself. Um, I was born in um, in New York, and my parents lived on the fifth uh, fifth story of uh, this building in Forest Hill, Queens. Uh, when my sister was born three three years later, they decided to move out into the suburbs of New Jersey, uh, and because they couldn't afford to move to the suburbs of of Long Island, which they wanted to, where all their friends is. So we moved to New Jersey, and uh, lived in in this house. Uh, which is a very, very uh, uh, house that's repeated over and over again. It's the same house that they change. So everyone does like little features on the house. Uh, but growing up in New Jersey, uh, about an hour from New York City, I turned to a lot of, of movies and I would watch movies like Star Wars uh, over and over again and became so fascinated about about the architecture, about uh, the, the world, creating these worlds, uh, these fantasy worlds. Uh, also movies like Blade Runner and the architectural visions of, of Ridley Scott and the, team, the production team. So movies became very, very important to me. New Jersey's not as exciting as Jordan, uh, not as much uh, interesting history there. Uh, I also spent some time uh, in Florida going to visit my grandmother who moved down to Florida uh, when I was born. I didn't take that personally, but uh, nevertheless, that's what happened. So I spent time in Florida going to her house as well as to Disney World and really appreciating the, the futuristic architecture uh, that Walt Disney 
uh, and his team of Imagineers created. Um, we spent some time uh, in Mexico growing up as a family on the holidays. So every year we would go to Mexico. So Mexico uh, was very, very inspiring to me in terms of creating these wonderful environments. And of course, the Mexican uh, Aztec ruins and the Mayan ruins. Uh, I had the pleasure of, of visiting them as well. But also watching a lot of James Bond movies uh, was very, very inspiring uh, for my for my architecture as well, uh, as all the villains had these incredible uh, layers where they, they hung out. Um, through my travels, I ended up working in the desert of New Mexico, uh, building sustainable houses out of recycled or reclaimed materials such as old tires and building houses that could exist off of the grid. And in my travels around um, the West, I looked at the, the, the sort of traditional homes of, of ancient civilizations and learned how they built with local materials. In a way, they built incredible architecture without architects mm -hmm. and how to find the, the right place to exist, that the shelter. So taking things out of the realm of architecture, but thinking about more about solving uh, human needs and creating the most optimal environment for humans to inhabit. I also lived in, in Rome and studied uh, Roman architecture and, and the history of, of three, many, many thousands of years and the scale and the proportion of classical architecture, as well as living in Japan and studying the way that architecture relates to the garden and relates to nature and, and celebrates nature. So all these things began to, to make a, a, a very large uh, impact on me. Uh, as well as the work of, of artists who worked with the land, land artists such as Donald Judd and his minimalist forms and how they can begin to express notions about architecture, about framing landscapes, about framing uh, the cosmic movements of the sun and the moon, as well as the uh, land art of, of Michael Heitzer, uh, this piece is called Double Negative from 1970, which was a year before I was born. So the idea of creating these large scale art pieces where uh, nature and art coexist is something really important in our work, as well as the land art of probably one of my most inspirational um, artists is the work of James Terrell. Uh, this is his Roden Crater project that's been ongoing for 40 plus years. It's actually uh, supposedly the largest artwork or, or um, ever created. And he basically took a crater and began to sculpt it. Um, and it really creating this wonderful way to, to see nature, to see the sky. Uh, this is not the Roden Crater, but this is another Terrell piece that is very inspirational to me. The way that uh, through very minimal gestures, creating the most heightened appreciation of the natural world. So what's fascinating to me is that although we're the most connected species, right? We can, I'm in Miami, you guys are in Jordan and elsewhere in the region. We've also in a way become the most disconnected. Mm -hmm. And what we're trying to do in our work is to, to reconnect ourselves uh, with nature, to reconnect with each other, and uh, to bring back that that kind of fascination uh, with the beauty that surrounds us. You know, thousands of years ago, I, I think people were like excited when the sun rise and when the sun set, and it was amazing. Now we sort of take these things for granted. So we're trying to to kind of retune people to to see the world and and let the architecture not be about uh what you see and and but more about what you can see from the architecture uh but the idea that in some ways that we made all this civilization about dominating nature but we want to see how we can kind of met, let nature thrive and let nature be the star and rebuild nature so through some of these projects i want to take you on that 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 journey and we want to help 
you and ourselves like learn how to how to live with the land and not on the land. And I think those like subtle uh, reversal of, of words is really important because it, it's about this coexistence. It's not about using the earth to our advantage, but to how we can coexist within the natural environment. So one of the first projects that that got us thinking about these things in the, in the Middle East is a project that we were asked to do it was a competition that we won to uh, create a, a new city for 150,000 people uh, in Abu Dhabi in this area called South Hudiriyat Islands. And what had happened here is that this industrial area, they when they created and dredged these areas for the industry, they destroyed the natural environment. And what we were trying to do is to regenerate nature and use the forces of the wind, as well as the tide, as well as erosion and other things to kind of accelerate the processes of terraforming. So we didn't want this to be like the palm in Dubai. We wanted it to be more about creating nature, about finding an opportunity for uh, the species of plants and the ecosystems around the mangrove to flourish, creating the most wonderful environment for the fauna that would exist there naturally, as well as providing the environment for our species. So the idea was rebuilding the mangroves, rebuilding nature, redesigning and recrafting the ecosystem, and then in turn, creating the most wonderful environment for our species. So here we begin to see how a city can exist uh, or coexist with nature and be built with nature rather than destroying it. So we were crafting and rebuilding nature uh, and thinking ways of how to live with the land rather than on the land. So for us, that, that became a really important stepping stone for our work and how we can can see about this coexistence. Uh, very, very important to us. Another project uh, that we began to to see how, how to live uh, in nature is a project for uh, Sheikha Musa in Qatar. And we were asked to, to come up with a way to celebrate wellness and health and uh, create something out uh, north of Doha that began to, to think of new ways to, to live in the desert. And what we wanted to do was, was not to alter the, the natural landscape. We didn't want to put in palm trees and other things and, and alter the landscape, but we wanted to celebrate the landscape and hide everything within this, this natural ecosystem, which were these dunes. So we began to sink buildings into the earth and build them out of the earth, uh, out of materials of the earth mixed with cement. We began to find ways, uh, and these were research institutions uh, where we began to study how we can farm within the desert. So in the circle, in the center of each circle, there was actually a, a farming uh, research facility. And then you can see here some of the inspiration again from, from Star Wars. This was actually a water farm. They were harvesting uh, water where Luke Skywalker grew up. But here you can begin to see that the architecture is almost invisible. You have these moments where you begin to see uh, some sort of architecture and you're not sure, you know, is it new, is it old, is it from an alien civilization? We we wanted to, to kind of create this, this unknown, but at the same time, create moments that were silent in that they were invisible from the outside. And we have this flooded um, waterway that brings water into the center of these natural formations. Uh, and the idea that the buildings can be invisible, but at the same time monumental, where we're creating this idea of silent monumentality because uh, the idea was to bring people to this location, and we felt that we needed to create something that was very powerful and very dramatic to bring people out to this environment and let the environment be what we're celebrating and the architecture to be nearly invisible and to be silent so that you could see the power 
of the sky, of the water, of the connection uh, to nature in this very, very powerful way. So carving into these dunes and, and creating an invisible yet highly amplified experience. And in the center of this was the wellness uh, component. And we were bringing together the scale of, of Roman bath with the atmospheric conditions of, of Islamic baths, such as you find in Turkey and other places. So we were creating this really hyper environment. Here is a video, I don't know how well it's gonna show, but it can give you an idea of the scale of the project. So for us, it's really about the collaboration with the clients and having these incredible clients like Sheikh Musa, who had the vision to create something really, really special. In fact, all the trees had to be native uh, trees. It, it was kept going back that. So for us, it's really about this shared vision of the beauty of nature. Um, for another project in Qatar, for a similar program, uh, we developed a walled city that existed on the coastline uh, and created this uh, circular uh, ring that brought you out uh, to a an island. And from there, you begin to see on the outside uh, this notion of the walled city, which is once again going back to, to history and this idea of, of protection, of about enclosure, uh, and how these old walled cities became very, very um, dense. And, and that was what we were looking for. So here you can see as you approach this wall, uh, you see some carvings. And this idea is that, is this something ancient? Is this something new? Is it something from the future, from an alien uh, race? We, we love that kind of mystery. 
So we're trying to establish these notions of, of timelessness, but also creating what we call uh, this notion of crafting paradise. So here you could see uh, the spa element as well, this wellness element. And within that, you have this, this wonderful um, garden dome uh, that exists within one of those shapes. So there's this, this incredible relationship between sky and light um, and finding ways to, to amplify the pleasures of existing within these environments. So here you can see along that walkway moments to uh, to connect, to celebrate uh, and the connection in, between family and friends around around the fire. So these things are, are really important to us. Uh, speaking of fire, uh, this is a, a video of a fire that we had made in the desert of Wadi Rum. And also speaking about uh, inspiring clients, uh, this is uh, one of our favorite clients, um, Serene Masri. Uh, she is Jordanian and she brought us to the deserts of, of Wadi Rum uh, to create uh, one of our uh, most incredible um, experiences. So we, this I guess would look familiar to you. Uh, for me, it was really exciting to to go out uh, into the desert, to go to Petra, to study about the Nebataeans and how they lived in the desert, uh, you know, 2300 years ago. So this was the site. And for us, when we got here, we were like, well, how do you put a hotel here? How do you put a resort here? And we began to realize, like, we really didn't want to once again, you know, put something on the land, but we wanted to build with the land to celebrate the unique nature of these places, not to change them or make them into something else. So we do a deep dive in terms of history, in terms of culture, in terms of flora and fauna. And these drawings and diagrams are something that we do to, to reconnect ourselves. We also had the ability with Serene to, to spend time in the desert, uh, you know, camping out for a bunch of nights, uh, connecting with local tribes, with the culture. And we began to realize that what's important here is what makes it unique. It's the people, it's the food, it's the music, it's also the silence. Because what's so beautiful about it is being there in the silence and not hearing civilization. And this idea of disconnecting and reconnecting and really becoming close uh, here, getting a little close with some of the locals, uh, you know, but that, that, you know, that's, that's really what understanding these places is to really like train ourselves to listen. And what makes it so fascinating for someone from New Jersey is to go to all these exotic places and see them with a fresh set of eyes and see them in a way that perhaps w was taken for granted. So here you can begin to see how we were using uh, gaming engines. This is actually a, a gaming engine where you can begin to see uh, through uh, this software the passage of time and how light can begin to react. Uh, these are part of a, a component, but what we were really fascinated with is looking at, at what was there thousands of years ago and how people lived within these mountains, carving into them. I mean, for us, there's nothing more beautiful than this. Obviously, it was probably not how they lived. There was a lot more ornamentation, but through the millennia, this this kind of beauty began to be more um, reduced to its essence. And that's also something really important for us. We like to reduce and reduce and reduce uh, to find the, the purity of, of the materials, the purity of the site. Um, and this project was broken down into different components and you entered through this arrival area where you would basically like remove yourself from technology and get more connected to the place. You would get dropped off here and from this point you would either walk by foot or by uh, camel. Uh, you can see somewhere over here where you would sort of get on the camel and and from that moment on you would be kind of brought into this ancient world 
And here you can see where the Jeeps will drop you off and how this very, very simple architecture that was actually made of the materials from the site mixed with cement and limited materials being brought in creates these very heightened moments to, to see what hasn't been seen before. And that is very, very important to us. So here you can see uh, drawings that many people have, have not seen because uh, only the client and, and the people who worked on them. But you can begin to see how we conceive of these spaces, how everything is about working with what's there. Uh, and if you go to another area, what was called the, the tent lodge, here you can begin to see how we work with the ancient Bedouin technology of weaving goat hairs uh, into a tent, into a shelter. And the idea of the, the tent, the Bedouin tent as sort of the, the ultimate loft experience. You know, people in New York are very happy with their lofts in Soho, but like the Bedouin tent was really like the first example of this loft living where everything was basically in, in one room. So we took these ideas of how they lived and and kind of re-envisioned them for how we can live today uh, in a more, you know, less from a, 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 a existence standpoint, but more from a, a sort of pleasurable uh, retreat standpoint. So here you can begin to see uh, images of these kind of amplified Bedouin tents, but still using the goat hair, uh, which is this incredible uh, technique that's that's woven. You know, no goats are are harmed in in that experience. They're they're shaved, uh, and we think it's incredibly sustainable. And also, the wind comes through the tents. Uh, and if it does rain, the, the fibers expand and create a watertight experience. So here you can see the Bedouin tents up against the walls. Uh, this is something that we learned from one of the, the local Bedouin leaders that, that you want, tribal leaders that you want to build back up against the wall for, for um, security purposes, but also uh, for environmental purposes. Uh, going into another uh, component of this uh, resort embedded in the mountains. Here we began to really pull from from Petra and to think how we can kind of build with ancient technology. So we didn't want to to scar the mountain. We wanted to kind of build within the shadows, within the crevices, and to make it almost invisible during the day, and then at night only exist with candles. So we we didn't want power. We wanted this to, we didn't want to use conditioning, air conditioning. We wanted to actually use ancient technology. So here you can begin to see how we carved into the space. You know, the world has become so dependent on technology. We want to see how we can kind of go backwards and, and think in a way almost like a, a future primitive. Um, so the idea of candles, I once went to Petra because uh, I've been there many times, uh, not only with the client, but also on some of my other travels uh, in Jordan. And I went there at uh, Petra by night, I guess a, a one night a week or two nights a week, they light it up with candles. And for me, that was that was it. I did not want any electricity. I didn't want people to be on their iPhones or iPads and have internet. It was all about disconnecting and, and reconnecting uh, and really becoming one with the environment and and that was very important for us and the way that we dealt with the environment was that the, the resort would be closed in the very very cold months and the very very hot months and uh and then the other months we were just playing with shadows and and sort of ancient technology of of building within within the rock to create some sort of thermal comfort uh here you can see uh the the what was known as the spa area and once again, we were we were building as invisibly as possible. We were finding the nukes and the crannies and and the, the opportunities to to build these experiences uh, within the rock. So here you can see uh, the spa component uh, carved into the rock uh, using ancient Nebatean technology to capture water. Because while it doesn't rain often, when it did rain, the Nebateans worked with a series of channels 
and cisterns that was carved in the rock to capture the water. And we wanted to do the same thing. And in this case, uh, use these cisterns not only to provide water for drinking and bathing, but also experiential chambers. Uh, here you can see someone uh, bathing in the water with this oculus that was inspired bit by the Pantheon in Rome. I also, uh, as I'd mentioned before, lived in Rome. So I'm constantly bringing my experiences. And that, that's what I think is so important uh, to find your unique voice in architecture, to kind of use your experiences, your, your unique experiences. It could be from movies, it could be from travels, it could be from, from anything, but that's what makes all of us uh, what we do so so important and and nothing is better than anything else it's just how we kind of celebrate our our unique perspective so here you can see uh how uh we were inspired by the work of donald judd uh, i'm sorry richard Serra in this case where we're building these walls out of rammed earth and we're trying to to have these walls block the sun but at the same time frame views of the landscape. So here you can see uh, these walls and how they become moments of protection. Because in this area, it was one of the few places that was more open and, and the client wanted to create something on the outskirts. So we created these walls to protect from the sand. Uh, and here you can see more of a, a kind of direct inspiration. I actually found this sculpture years afterwards. I had Richard Serra in my mind, but I wasn't actually aware of this, but very, very similar. And, and you can see by using the earth mixed with cement, how you can kind of blend into the environment and from within begin to see this, this more focused, heightened experience and the path of the sun kind of riding along the walls. So never giving you that, that full uh, sunlight, but at sunset would exist kind of how the, the walls would, would frame the, these moments. So I, I'm, I'm really fascinated with the way that ancient civilizations used the sun and the moon and other celestial bodies. Um, they were more connected to them. So they, they had these moments within the architecture that began to celebrate, you know, the equinox and some of the other uh, moments uh, of, 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 you know, very unique moments within the calendar. So this was an, another part of the project that existed within uh, this, this little um, uh, reserve, if you will. And the idea was that the architecture would begin to kind of mimic the shape to almost kind of nestle, nestle in, uh, you know, into the earth, almost like, uh, you know, like um, kind of cuddling, if you will. Um, so the idea would be that we would build this uh, with the cement that would be uh, made from the local earth, the crushed stone. So it would really be one uh, with the rock because in a way that's how this rock was formed. This rock is sedimentary and it's all about compressing and uh, layers of sand and pressure. So that for us is what we wanted to do and then turn that into an architecture uh, in this case, you could see the water used again by collecting the water. Uh, we didn't want to pump any water, so we would really collect all the water through these kind of ancient civilizations. The other thing that we were interested in was not just creating this resort and bringing in food. We wanted to use uh, to grow our own food. We worked with an incredible um, landscape architect um, from Miami, a professor here, and we, we uh, Roberto Rivera, and we wanted to um, have all the gardens and we wanted to make the farm. So it wasn't just about um, having a place for people to come to and, and making them kind of not pay attention to where they are. You know, this wouldn't be about getting a pizza. You know, this was about some of my most incredible experiences in my life were sitting around the fire in the desert of, of Wadi Rum with the Bedouins playing their instruments and you know this incredible meal that was cooked in the sand uh, you know buried in a canister within the sand of, of lamb and chicken and and couscous and the vegetables everything dripping down and cooking it it's like 
I dreaming about that. I'm actually pretty hungry right now. This is kind of my lunch time. But um, you know, to me, that's that's kind of what the experience is about. So we're we're creating the whole ecosystem. We wanted everything that was going to be used in this resort to be built locally to be done by local craftsmen and we were actually even planning in one of the neighboring villages to create schools to teach or let me say more reteach people the crafts of their their heritage and we began to look at at, at different um places uh where there existed crafts within jordan and we had the client bring us to all these different places but many of the local villages people began to kind of lose that that thinking and that skill so we wanted to kind of rebuild uh that heritage uh, and it was important for us not to just think of this as a resort but think a bit of how it can enrich the community what is the social impact yes of course it can provide hospitality jobs but can it actually build something more and and we even conceived of uh, a walking stick that you know it took hours and hours to sort of walk around the site so here we began to see how we can create even this notion of a walking stick with a compass and a light and a knife and and you know so if you did get left out there how would you uh survive um another project for the same inspiring client uh they asked us to to create a clubhouse uh this is an akaba and um, they were asked us to do a clubhouse would be sort of the community center for this big um, community that was being built on the Red Sea. And when we got there, we began to see the surrounding hills and mountains and this incredible color and texture and shapes. And, you know, that one of the briefs was it needed to be iconic. And which you you kind of get in Dubai and in China, you know, we people are always thinking, how can I make something iconic? And for me, in a way, I I, I see that as as something we want to avoid. You know, we want to kind of do something unique and powerful and dramatic. And in that way, it you know, it maybe serves what the client is looking for. But we also, as as we discussed in some of the previous projects, want to do something that's invisible want to do something that is of the land that is built actually with the land and makes it so unique and so special so we got to the site and we saw dunes that were formed uh somewhat by construction some by wind patterns um that existed because of what they were doing construction and we said you know this is what we want this is the project we're done so obviously that takes a little bit more time than just saying it so we wanted to basically inhabit the dune inhabit the land kind of like playing with the sand and carving it out and creating these moments that frame the beautiful surroundings of nature uh, so here you can see a, a site plan uh that exists and then some of the the sort of thinking the engineering that goes behind uh my crazy ideas um so you know we have architecture is is really a team sport um and we have a lot of great people uh who help kind of create these these dreams these shared dreams so in this case uh you know we worked on the design uh with our team here in miami um alex lozano uh, one of the um key designers in our office uh, modeled this and then brought it in uh, to the office in Switzerland uh, where uh, Bayad Husler, who runs the office, and Rassem, uh, who's actually Jordanian, uh, is, um, you know, our local Jordanian talent star. Uh, he worked on this project and really uh, Bayat and Rassem uh, were on site doing all the magic, making the magic happen and uh, you know, uh, giving the glory uh, to our, our office uh, in this really incredible project. So here you can see some of these these beautiful drawings uh, done by uh, Rassem and, and, and Bayat. And it's hard to kind of draw this. So uh, really interesting to kind of see some of the behind the scenes. 
And then here you can begin to see how we begin to, to occupy the earth, uh, to sculpt the earth and to insert life uh, within the earth. And here you can see um, some of the drawings as well that, that the team did that, you know, it's not just about putting something down on paper, it's about capturing the emotion, about kind of celebrating the atmosphere. And what's fascinating about this project is there are, it's it's slightly unconventional in that the the structure is the shape, is the form. Um, and this took uh, a tremendous amount of effort, but in the end, the way that we crafted the building was very, very low tech. And we wanted it to be very, very um, uh, earthy and powerful. We didn't want it to be shiny and pristine. We wanted it to, to feel of the earth and to feel that it was actually earth and not building. And that's a really important thing for our work. We, we want to kind of blur the boundaries between building and earth. We want to kind of make them come back together, uh, to fuse them back together. Um, and you can see here how that, that begins to happen uh, within this type of environment, that it's not really a building, it's something in between. It's almost more geology than architecture. Uh, and here you can begin to see how that exists and how these things begin to frame nature and become part of the landscape. So getting back to how this building was built, it's incredibly low tech. Uh, we had, uh, you know, pretty much a, a very limited uh, skill set of the local workers. So we brought in some two people from Switzerland who were uh, training the local team how to build this. And what was fascinating about this is that it was kind of a pedantic exercise, a pedagogical exercise in that we were teaching them how to build in this small structure and, and were there on site the whole time. And then the next structure, they were the, the team from Switzerland was only there um, a couple of times. And then the next structure that we're gonna be building, uh, they probably won't show up at all. But here you can begin to see there's, there's no machinery. We only had one um, element of technology, but everything is, is basically done by hand. And that's what's really beautiful for us, that it's very low tech. It's not about high tech architecture. This is about really low tech architecture, building with the hand, you know, feeling the energy from the people who crafted these buildings. And then there's one machine that would come in at the end uh, and, and pump cement that was mixed uh, with the local earth. But you can kind of see this, this very, crafted building and uh, and how the building begins to emerge from the earth. So here you can see how that begins to look uh, in the construction or the, the construction process. So very, very low tech building, very inexpensive building. This wasn't about importing some high tech spaceship. This was really about building with the earth with limited technology with limited cost and creating something that that was basically one with the site. So here you can begin to see um, the earth building, uh, similar to how we built in New Mexico, where we used the earth uh, and mixed it uh, with cement to and other things to to create architecture and how this building blurs with its surroundings. Uh, here you can see uh, Bayad Husler and some of the team. Uh, testing out the the structure of the building, which uh, thankfully is, is still standing. Mm -hmm. And then there was uh, an incredible artist. Um, I don't have the the pronunciation. I was uh, just gonna check on that again. Hold on one second. Um, let's see here. Um, he's a a Jordanian artist, and he his name is Mohammed Kayat. Tuka or something like that. And he was brought in by our client to take minerals that are local and impregnate them into the structure. So this was really, really exciting to us to take 
all the minerals, these local minerals, and begin to integrate it into the architecture and become one. So here you can see um, a very, very scientific technique of how we were able to, to create this beautiful um, mineral rich architecture. So it's very scientific. Very precise. But this to us is what's really magical. It's not about, um, you know, perfection. It's about feeling the energy of the people who, who make the building. It's about, you know, the interesting characters who you meet and the time out on the site and making this type of architecture. So what's fascinating, that's actually phosphorus, uh, which is highly explosive. And um, he ends up, you know, walking around with a, a lighter and a lit cigarette while his hand is coated in phosphorus and we're imagining that you know we're going to blow up and or his hand is at least going to blow up but you know it was an incredible process um and uh, we were so happy uh with the results here you can see uh the use of of gold dust that becomes impregnated into the shell. So there was a lot of experimentation and a lot of uh, passion that, that went into this. And then you could see some of the, the richness and depth uh, into the surfaces. And then uh, the local metalwork creating these beautiful shadows and the dance of, of light through the space, uh, really creating something for us, that is is very atmospheric. I, we like to say that we're you know form to us follows feeling. We're crafting atmospheres. We're not thinking about architecture. We're thinking about environment and atmosphere. And uh, here you can begin to see how that plays out in this first very small building. And then you can see the sort of uh, you know sensuous curves of of the building and how it is really earth. It's it's not architecture it's it's something that's in between the earth and the architecture and here you can begin to see uh the academy building that exists uh and how it really becomes part of its its landscape and that for us was a very enriching uh process so uh the last project i'm gonna show you although there are many more in many different places as well as some regionally is a project that we've been also working on in the Red Sea. And this project was um, a project um, by the Crown Prince of, of Saudi Arabia and his very uh, enlightened perspective to protect the environment. Um, so what's fascinating is that Saudi Arabia and the Red Sea in Saudi Arabia has the most protected reef system in the world, the most unaffected because there has been no development. So what we were answering in the brief of this project was to create a resort and research institute that would allow people to, to connect with this incredible ecosystem. So the location of each one of these structures, uh, I've, it's the only project I've ever worked on where we received drawings, engineering drawings that showed the location of all life that would exist on the site, both in the water and on the land. So the only places where there was no habitat for turtles, for birds, for fish, was where we placed these uh, pods. And the idea behind this is like we would use shipbuilding. You know, in this case, we were not thinking about sort of the hand, but more thinking about delicately preserving this ecosystem and this environment. So we would be building these pods uh, in shipbuilding facilities and then bringing them in and delicately inserting them uh, into this very, um, you know, beautiful and pristine environment. So for us, this is really a very heightened experience to nature. The idea of, 
of how the sky and and nature is why you're here. This is not about architecture. Yes, it's probably a very futuristic and otherworldly architecture, but to us, it's really about celebrating and making the architecture as invisible as possible, as blending in with the environment as we possibly can. And even the, the connecting tissue that we were putting that where you can walk uh, in a very, very uh, thin film of water at, at high tide, we wanted to kind of bury the walkway uh, at, at its highest tide with just a, a very small amount of, of, of water. This is all actually uh, a, a reef system, uh, which would be accreted from the minerals. So the idea is that everything we do would be habitat. Everything we do would become a place that would help the environment rather than hurt the environment. And in thinking that, you know, we want people to see things um, to really connect with nature, we hope that in tune that would kind of rethink how we, we coexist on this planet. So uh, some of these projects were inspired uh, in some ways from my upbringing of, of watching movies. So this is a book that actually I've been working on for probably 20 years. It's called Lair, and it's uh, the radical homes and hideouts of movie villains. So, um, you know, ever wonder why bad guys live in good houses? Um, this is kind of a, a book that showcases uh, the inspiration uh, behind my uh, kind of thinking as an architect. I, I like to think, though, that we we prefer to, to build uh, for good people. Uh, in addition, we have uh, this book, which speaks about some of our, our work and the idea of spirit of place, uh, which is very important to us, that our work is is all about where we're building. It's not about bringing where we live uh, to the place, but really thinking about the place. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, a really interesting book. The book itself is, is sort of a, uh, a marvel of, of design. I wish I could say that I designed the, the book, but it's, uh, by an incredible group at Tra Publishing, as well as the publisher, there's like this really incredible, uh, seam. So, uh, there's, um, you know, in honor of this talk, we, we spoke with the publisher and got a, a special discount. Uh, if you enter this code through TRA Publishing, um, they're going to work on, on getting you guys a discount and uh, delivering these books. So uh, all the proceeds uh, from the books actually go to supporting uh, environmental uh, causes, global environmental causes such as Oceana, which protects all the waters uh, of our planet. So uh, in closing, I, I wanted to uh, just thank you all for, for listening. We're gonna have some questions. Uh, I'm closing with an image of uh, my mother and I, uh, when I was a kid on the site of, of that house that I showed you in New Jersey, and uh, you know wanted to uh, thank you for coming on this journey with me. Um, if any of you, want to email me. I, I apologize if it does go to spam because a lot of emails do go to spam, but here is my email address. Uh, or if you want to um, direct message me on Instagram, which I'm not really that good at Instagram, uh, you can go through our Instagram uh, uh, tag here. So I, I guess with that, I will uh, stop blabbering and uh, open up to any questions. That I guess will be be read from the team. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, we're you. on your screen. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much, Mr. Chad. It has been an amazing lecture. We will listen to Rukaya first. She's going to ask the first question. Go ahead, Great. Rukaya. Uh, thank you for your uh, information. I really enjoyed what you said. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm so interested in your way of thinking and start uh, uh, designing the project. So I want to ask what's the process that the architect should follow to come up with a good design? Yeah, well, I think what's really important for us is um, the site, right? The place, you know, and what we want to do is 
is tap into that, you know, to uncover the spirit of the place. And that really, to me, is about going to the site, immersing ourselves in the site. We like to spend time there, camp out often uh, if we can. You know, sometimes we're not allowed to camp out, but we like to go to the site in all different times of day and uh, and see how the light is and, and see also uh, how people lived uh, historically in these, how is how are these areas um, inhabited without technology? That to us is kind of really important. You know, how do we create the optimal habitat for, for not only our species, but for all of the species, right? And how do we not destroy what's on the site, but actually celebrate what's on the site? So I think it's really about about uh, tuning out and tuning in, about really like listening. And I, I, I don't want to sound kooky, but, you know, like feel the energy, you know, like what, like Michelangelo kind of uh, used to say, like if he was looking at a block of stone, of you know, marble, he'd be like, you know, what does the marble want to become? You know, and that that to me is is kind of the way I that that we think about the argument, like what what does this site want to become? How do we work with the unique characteristics of the site, of the landforms, of you know what's the best way to occupy the land? And you know, of course, we do projects all around the world, and some are high rises and other, but it's always like that same same thinking process. You know, the same thought process is you know how do we want to inhabit it? And you know, I think what's what's really important is not to to use the brain as much but to kind of feel it with your heart right like i i i, I heard that from someone and i never really kind of understood it but you know it's like when you use your brain too much you you kind of intellectualize and overthink like you know obviously it's not the heart itself but you know the idea of of more feeling rather than analysis and I, I think for me I'm I'm trying to get even more into that because our design process is very arduous. It's like a very long journey and we we like to go to a site and think of ourselves almost as archaeologists uncovering the truth, uncovering how people lived, how they what did they eat, what they, you know these are the how did they build, what materials like you know, how did they get water? How did they deal with, you know, those are the things for me, I find fascinating. And, you know, and, and we try to bring that through the process and, and design the whole ecosystem, not just the architecture. And I think, you know, today, especially as we have so much ability to see uh, an unprecedented amount of architecture, um, we, we never had that ability right like people would travel and see our you know but now i could like search online and see you know billions of projects or whatever it is and and they're all phenomenal so you know i i think for us you know there's there's a resistance to generate um form in an arbitrary way we we like to think about letting the land kind of tell us what the form might be or or you know the energies of the site kind of give us the answer rather than arbitrarily generating something in um, in the computer. So there's many different projects that I can kind of go into that, um, but we we like to kind of find the solution um, mm -hmm. and rather than uh, kind of make it uh, arbitrary. So I don't know if that that helps. There's probably That's much it. more that, that could be spoken about but uh it's it's very site generated and of course client generated i mean i i do believe having clients with incredible vision is more important in a way than than us you know having the vision like it's because they're the ones who are going to build it right so you know we we kind of try to bring together our philosophies the site as well as like the client's visions. You know, like when I read the Wadi Rum brief from Serene, it was as if I wrote it myself. And uh, probably it was more eloquent. And, you know, so for us, that's that's really important that these people 
find us somehow, you know, from, and from around the world and, and understand what we're doing and that we're able to kind of go on that, that journey together. So it's a, it's a collaborative um, effort with not only the people in the office, the great team that makes all these dreams happen, but also the client uh, is so important. So. According to this, what's uh, the difference and what's special to, des to design a project in the Middle East? Well, I think uh, going back to the client, there's, um, you know, what we've experienced is there's a, a tremendous um, I, desire and, and vision for something magical. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I probably showed you half of the projects or less of like what we've worked on. And I, I really wanted to focus this on kind of the desert and landscape and thinking about that. But, you know, we've worked in Dubai and, you know, on many interesting projects and they all have a similar philosophy. But, you know, I think the Middle East for me is, is, is there's this really, I mean, first of all, the people are, are so fantastic. I've, you know, I've only had like the most ingratiating experiences wherever I've, I, I've traveled. Um, and, you know, I, I think that there's this, there's this real, um, you know, passion for, there's like a romance in the way that things are, are, are kind of envisioned. There, there's big dreaming, you know, and of course that has challenges, right? Like sometimes you dream too big or you get too close to the sun, you might, you know, fall. So, you know, it's a slightly a double-edged sword, uh, but I, I think like there's this, just this, I, I get really aligned uh, with the thinking of the, of the people who are creating these projects and and the shared vision of creating something really magical and and there's just this incredible romance and storytelling and and high level of thinking uh, in all the clients that, that that we've worked with many of which are you know leaders of of different countries and and stuff like that so I think like we're very much aligned and and for me also the the landscape uh, is so inspiring, you know, like to sit in Wadi Rum, to think about Aqaba and the history and and all these things and, and or be on the Red Sea and go snorkeling and diving and see, you know, the beauty that exists and we want to preserve, I mean, the mountains and the light, you know, it's just maybe because I'm a, an outsider from New Jersey uh, growing up in the quiet suburbs of New York it's it's super like romantic for me to like spend time in the desert and but you know I have that philosophy everywhere wherever we work you know it's like just a real like immersion into the place and and for me you know the Middle East playing with sand playing in the deserts uh you know but I, I think you see it even in a lot of the artists I showed you like they weren't doing their their land art you know, in the jungle per se, of course, we work in the jungles too, but you know, the desert is sort of, uh, you know, a playground uh, because it's so vast and so powerful and so transmutable uh, in a way, right? Because it's always moving and changing and, and um, you know, so I, I think it's, it's not only me who ha has been inspired by, by its mystical, mystical powers i you know i i, I just i really uh, really connect with it so yeah um now we're gonna take a couple one question from the audience and then we're gonna go to jinan and then we're gonna go back to the audience uh, okay great um, a question that's been repeated multiple times is how we can how did you design the building to combat the really um tough environment like heat wise because it's very hot, how can you design a place where it will be like cold enough, you know, won't bother the people that will come to the place? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's a that's a really good question. I mean, you know, in a place like Wadi Rum, which has like an incredible um, swing of temperature, if you will, like, you know, probably not the best place to be in like the super heat. Now, I was out there in like July when or probably early July 
and it was hot. And and interestingly enough, we were sitting under one of these goat hair tents, and it was actually really cool. So uh, for us, it's about um, mitigating the climate, and of course, uh, protecting from the sun is is really critical. Um, you know, even in traveling around Saudi Arabia in the summer, I don't know why I always end up going in the the summer. Maybe uh, maybe that's good, so I can really get you know, attuned, but like, you know, walking around uh, the deserts uh, and hiding in the shadows, you know, like it's about kind of finding those ecosystems. Uh, and, you know, for us, like shadow is so important. So, you know, in a project like in Aqaba, it's about basically creating shadows and shade and having like very big overhangs and aligning the building to to capture the breeze uh, and really um, using minimal technology because there's very limited space that's conditioned you know it's 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 using kind of ingenuity or ancient thinking to um, a accomplish a more comfortable thermal en environment and that that being said it's not going to be as refreshing as walking into an air conditioned space. Um, and, but, you know, I think what we're trying to do is, is limit that. And, you know, there are other projects in other places um, where we, we deal with the environment. You know, every environment is, is, is so different. So we, we really try to understand everything, humidity and where the sun is rising and the sun is setting and, you know, when it's, hot out like you probably don't want to like capture the sun setting yeah. the sunrise is still good because it's a little bit cooler but you know it's really just being hyper sensitive i'm mm -hmm. a very sensitive person in general you know but uh, i guess many of us architects are but you know it's like it's being like hyper sensitive to the the conditions and you know using technology when you you need it but really about finding those those moments about you know like you want to be in the shade in the summer but maybe in the winter when it's a little cool you want to capture that sun like how do you do that how do you how do you like work with um the environment and mitigate it you're not going to solve everything um you know in wadi rum we were saying let's close the resort in like the the most you know, extreme swings of the the weather. Of course, if you had to live there year round, you wouldn't have that option. And we would probably think of something else. But as a resort, you know, we think it, it's probably better to kind of think about that um, as part of the experience. And uh, so anyway, uh, you know, I can show you on many different projects how we kind of contain that, uh, you know. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of our, our thinking. Definitely. Um, we will have a question from Zinan. We have 15 minutes left. Uh, Zinan, you can start. Okay, well, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the movie side. You started, you, when you started, you talked about how you were inspired a lot by movies. And I also love movies and I love how architecture has become a big part of like how a director tells a story through the architecture. And we, we, we also think of an architect as a storyteller because he tells a story mm -hmm. through his architecture. Mm -hmm. So um, how was it working with the director as a client? Because he also is, pays attention to details. He also has his own vision. So how did you collaborate with Mike, uh, the director, Michael Bay, to, and how did that affect your process in the design of his house <laughs> in LA? <laughs> that <laughs> is a very good question. I'm just finding uh, Michael's house here. Hold on, I will bring it up. Um, well, I would say that you know, there, there's the politically correct version of that story. And then there's like the story I will tell you guys. Do you see the <laughs> screen again? I, yeah, but I still can't see anything. It's just, yeah, no. no okay. Working. Yeah. So, um, well, first of all, like I have like the most utmost respect for, for Michael. Mm -hmm. um, he called me many, many years ago. He's like, I just bought an apartment in a building that you designed and I really love your work. And one day I really want to build a house with you. And then I never heard from him again. 
And then years later, he calls me again. And I, actually, I didn't even know who he was when he first called, but I was like, wow, that's cool, this young Hollywood director. <laughs> um, and then, um, then he calls me again. He was more successful. He's like, oh, I'm just buying a house in Miami that you designed. I want you to help me uh, kind of fix it fixed it up because it was built by a developer who was being very cost uh, sensitive and he really didn't do a good job building it. So I was like, yeah, sure. So I helped Michael on that. And uh, he actually didn't do any of those changes yet. But during that time, I was talking to his team and he's like, oh, Michael's buying a piece of land in, in California for a house there. And I guess this is like about 2009 or something like that. And I was like, oh my God, I need to do that. How I've always like dreamed about doing something in, in California. And um, I, I called Michael, I said, hey, Michael, I'm gonna be out in LA. Um, I'd love to see the site you're doing. Uh, you're gonna build a house on. And actually I wasn't planning to be in LA. I just said like, I made it up and I was actually flew out there and, and said like I'm in LA, <laughs> you know? So exactly. I tried to force that, that hand. Um, <laughs> And basically he's like, oh, dude, there's so many great architects in LA. I'm already working with this other great architect. Like, why do I need someone from Miami to, you know, to come and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, just give me a chance. So, um, you know, he actually did a little competition. And uh, needless to say, we, we, we beat out like this really awesome firm from LA and, um, and we ended up doing Michael's house, which I, here's some, just some images of it. But, you know, like Michael is probably like one of the most creative people um, I've ever met. I mean, he is a, a, you know, whether you like his movies or not, like he is a genius and is incredible uh, about what he does. And, you know, working with someone like that he's he's very he can like envision so much and that had like a, a lot of benefits and a lot of challenges that he had such vision right because um you know in, in fact it was kind of interesting so you know he always like teases me where like you know laughs about it is like when i was out there i was like you know like tasting the soil and listening to the land and like feel, you know he was like what the hell are you doing like i was like really getting into the site and um you know and then i did this this sketch that was very rough and you know kind of more from the heart about like the sort of the energies if you will the the forces on the site that you kind of have to like tap into you know where are the views where's the sun where's the this how do you want to enter so and it turns out like that the house was very much uh, based on that sketch and in fact like when he opened the house for his birthday, his 50th birthday, some years ago, I gave him a framed version of that uh, original sketch. So, um, you know, it was not without its challenges. Um, I probably lost a few years of my life dealing <laughs> with Michael. Uh, you know, I, I definitely think there is like a, a love hate relationship. I've never had such set anyone yell at me so much or yell at them so much you know it was uh but you know it's um and i it think failed. the end result it, it wasn't just uh, there was a team of so many different people including like very talented uh interior designer and builders and local architects to kind of help bring this through so michael kind of made this like a movie project mm -hmm. and um you know and a lot of the times it was not easy to for him to understand that it wasn't a movie you know, because we would be like building the foundation that took us a year to design and get permitted. He's like, no, we got to move this wall. And I'm like, no, 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 this is not like a movie set where you just move a wall. It's like, this is like engineers and permits. And, you know, so he had a little bit of a, a cavalier attitude about uh, you know, how easy it is to kind of build in reality versus like building sets that mm -hmm. mimic reality. Um, but all in all, it was like, you know, an incredible experience, uh, highly stressful. Uh, but, you know, really the end result was, you know, 
it's very much about Michael. It's, you know, it's, it's us trying to tapping into the site, tapping into the client, uh, and really understanding, you know, the possibilities of, of living in Los Angeles. And, um, you know, so this is like a really interesting point. Michael like sent me a bit, like, I want some angled glass somewhere and I'm like, oh, okay, like we'll do it. You know? So we came up in our, our scheme, angling the glass in this lower pool cabana uh, room. And we said, yeah, it would be great if we could like lift this up and, and have the ability to open the entire wall. And everyone's like, you guys are crazy. This is like a, you know, a fifth, almost like a 14 meter long piece of, of window. And uh, Michael's like, oh, no worries. I'm gonna have my guys who do my sets uh, design it. So you use hydraulics to like lift up the buildings and like when the when we were doing the house, he was like filming Transformers three or four. I was or maybe about both. to say it seems like a and, Transformers like, vibe. Yeah, and we would like go onto the set. I would go there to meet him because he really gets so immersed in the 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 films. He like you know never leaves. And I would be on the set and the buildings would be like tilting and like everything's falling. And he'd be like, everyone clean up. So I'd like drop what I was doing and like clean up. He's like, no, not you. You know, <laughs> what are you doing? You know, so, um, you know, it was fun. So he had his like set guys who do all the hydraulics for the movies where you see the buildings. Like that's actually the buildings are actually. So he built like for Transformers 3, I guess, like this whole office floor plate and had it like moving on hydraulics. So those guys helped us do this. And they were really brilliant because this window uh, is very heavy and it's actually counterweighted. So the hydraulic lift closes the window instead of keeping, uh, instead of opens the window. So this is like with these weights, you can see in another picture, um, the building is, uh, the window is in this kind of equilibrium stasis and then the hydraulic closes the window uh it is like a, a little transformer uh and yeah. then you could see some of the things here and then here you could see that window with the two counterweights that were exposed um and, the, and that big window so you know it was like it was really exciting i mean i still speak with michael all the time especially now he's not that busy so i you know we speak every week or two and uh you know it's really great to have these collaborations with these these very visionary people and uh certainly as in the movies um you know as a director you're you're envisioning these things so i had michael actually write me like a 10 page script of the house and that's kind of what we used as the the basis of our our thinking i love when clients give me so much information and it could be just random thinking i mean that to me is is really exciting to have that those thoughts and they don't have to be architectural thoughts you know it could be like i love looking at clouds you know or whatever it is so um you know that that's really a fun a fun project yeah it's interesting when like a director's world collides with an architect world and something beautiful comes out <laughs> it's like yeah a really amazing house so how was it when you seen them incorporate half of the house on top of a high-rise building in the movie because they didn't use the whole house they only used half like a part of it and then they yeah. did movie yeah. magic and then they turned it into a whole different um atmosphere yeah that, that was like a lot of fun so um yeah essentially I got a call from from Michael, like, hey, can you help me on this movie I'm doing? And I want to incorporate some of the house. So then he had his like production designer um, call me up and we started like brainstorming and, and whatnot and, you know, back and forth ideas. And, and then they, you know, I never saw it again until the end of the movie. So yeah, so it's essentially like that pool from the house uh, they built up in the high rise and then there's actually a very short scene actually a really depressing scene to have in in the house because this hasn't been used in in any of his films which i'm i'm begging him to like make a movie about the house i want to do like a movie about <laughs> that not like 
you know, like a movie that takes place in the house. Like I don't have like the storyline, but I'm always like, we got to do something that's like, you know, about the house, you know. And unfortunately, like the only scene that he ever shot actually in the house was in uh, Six Underground as well, where this girl was kind of witnessing that her father got shot or like it was like oh my god like so depressing so you can see like a moment there i don't think she sees the the shooting but he a guy gets shot like in the presence of his daughter who comes out after but um that's that's one moment at the house but you know we've uh, worked again with other movie directors like michael mann uh who did miami vice and heat and uh you know, a lot of really awesome movies. And he shot uh, the Miami Vice movie, a part of it in our house where I where I live. And also someone got shot there. So I'm always like, my architecture becomes a place where where Misery. in the movies people are getting, uh, getting shot. So we're shot. gonna work on uh, better storylines for our architecture. Uh, next, we have a question okay. from the audience and Rukhaya is gonna ask it. Yes, I have a question from Yaqub, uh, Jad Yaqub from Jordan. Did you feel like making the de design sustainable presented challenges for the functionally and why are we investing, investing into sustainable architecture now more than ever? Yeah, well, I think uh, that's a really interesting question in that I think like this pandemic obviously is horrible and, and you know, we, we obviously never wished it on anyone, but I think it's like, it allowed us a, a moment to like really appreciate the outdoors to to you know maybe some people have been locked up in apartments and they can't go on the street so i think like now more than ever people are appreciating the natural world and i hope with that appreciation that there's a a desire to protect it right and i and i think a lot about um you know nature in, in today, right? Like Venice, the canals, you see dolphins coming in there, you know, like Miami, the water is getting better, um, you know, less travel uh, with airplanes and cars and pollution. And, you know, in LA, you could like see for miles and miles. And, and you know, it's like, it's a really interesting effect on, you know, how we begin to slow down and, and see the world. There's um, some really interesting poetry coming out. There's like this poem by this, how the people stayed home and how, uh, that's what it's called, and the people stayed home and how, uh, you know, we begin to slow down and appreciate ourselves and the relationships and cherish them even more, right? Because so much has been taken away from us. And uh, so I think like, you know, in some ways it's a, it's a reset for us to kind of um, see what's important, right? To to see that nature is important, that relationships and society are are important, and that you know what what do you cherish most? Uh, you know when you have you know much of your your life kind of taken away from you. So you know I I think like the idea of sustainable architecture, I, I, you know. I, I think of the word sustainable. I think sustainable is a great thing to, to think of, but I, I think it's more about like, how can we create architecture that doesn't destroy the planet, but like preserves it and generates life and celebrates, you know, the the beauty that, that we uh, have taken for granted. So, um, you know, that's that's really where we're coming from. You know, we're not like thinking like, oh, we need to get these lead points and and do this environmental toilet because we're going to get a credibility with lead and or any of the other esti whatever it is in in the in um uh, I forget estimata or some something in in um in the UAE um you know it's more about hey we got to preserve the the water there's very little water that exists on our planet so we should preserve it you know we should use the water we should use the wastewater you know to to um again and again right so it's all these things that are coming from a perspective of um you know not just doing sustainability because it's kind of a, 
forced upon us, but more about how can we how can we really preserve our planet? Because at the end of the day, you know, it's all about creating what is precious for us, right? Like we're 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 selfish in our pursuits because it's not about like oh like you know the earth that's gonna you know hate when we pollute the water yeah like the earth doesn't really care you know like it's more about like do you want to swim near plastic you know do you want to not have enough drinking water right like at the end of the day you know if we extinct our species because of um you know not taking it take you know protecting the environment the earth will still exist you know so it's really it even though we're behaving selfishly by, you know, um, out using the resources, it, it, we have to we have to think about it in a new way because you know we're the ones who are going to suffer, right? Like, yeah, maybe some animals will become extinct, but I guarantee you, like, we will probably become extinct before, you know, uh, everything that nature uh, produces will, will become extinct. So I, I think it's I I come from it from that perspective, like it, we have no other choice, you know, we have to uh, preserve and, and protect for our own own species, so. Okay, okay. Um, one more question from the audience. Uh, everybody wants to know what was your favorite project to work on out of all the projects you did? Yeah, in a way it's almost like, who's your favorite kid, right? Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I, you I think, spot. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't I don't think I have one, but I will say like, you know, I'm not just saying it because you guys are in Jordan and, and the connection there, but like certainly, uh, you know, working in Wadi Rum and that type of project and really, uh, you know, understanding what the client wanted and the site was, you know, you need like great things, right? You need like a great client with a great vision. You need a great site. And you also need a client who will like appreciate that vision and uh, or your vision and and be collaborative, right? And and so I think like you know those believe it or not, it's it's pretty difficult to find all of that, right? And yeah. then also someone who wants to work with you um, from another side of the world, right? So I think you know to me that was 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 really spectacular. I mean the one negative of that project is that it never came to conclusion you know like it started and then there was some uh challenges with um land ownership with the local tribes and at the end of the day like you know it it got stopped but um you know i think that plate that project has like a really um you know strong place uh in my heart and uh and i think it also helped us um, crystallize our thinking right like so each project whether it happens or not um really helps us to um to kind of like refocus you know and and um and and see things in in new ways that are are, are pretty um helpful for future projects so that, that's an important uh lesson for us is to to constantly try to learn to constantly try to push ourselves and uh you know it's a it's a, it's a very um challenging process to birth a uh, a building uh you know even like the one isla in uh, aqaba um you know that was not easy it was you know it took a tremendous effort on everyone including the client uh, you know, the builders, the artists, uh, our team, you know, our own investment in, you know, putting in more time than we could afford to be paid by the client to do the job, you know, so all those things, the sacrifices, you know, it's kind of like, it's kind of in a way like the reference of a, like having a child, right? Like, you know, you <laughs> give it all and then, you know, like Lots it's, of uh, <laughs> a beautiful a beautiful thing at the end. So uh, I love all my children, you know, building. <laughs> and, you know, my, my greatest creations are are my own my own children. But uh, I, I love uh, all the projects and, and the great clients that we 
we get to work with. So. Thank you so much. Uh, we would like to thank you so much. The ArcNode team likes to thank you. Thank you, Jinan. Thank you, Ruqayya. And thanks for the audience from all around the world. We are truly honored and we are so happy that you were with us. We got a lot of questions and it's hard because we only have no time left right now. <laughs> so um, uh, we're sorry if we didn't answer all of your questions. And thank you all for attending. Thank you. Yeah, feel free to uh, email or uh, you know reach out. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. bye. Hope to see you guys in real life in the near future. Yes. <laughs> After coronavirus. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Bye. Bye. bye.